Thank you, Betty. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to try to go really quickly through a bunch of slides and uh, talk a little bit about um, this project that we did uh, back in 2007. Um, uh, many of you know uh, it's impossible not to, to notice that under Mayor Daley there was a, a particular kind of uh, emphasis on culture that you might call co corporate populism, which is exemplified, you could say, by the, the uh, major building projects, things like the Millennium Park and the Modern Wing, but also by um, uh, cows on parade. At least that was part of what, what Mayor Daley seemed to be uh, interested in saying uh, culture in Chicago was about, splashy big projects. Now, Rahm Emanuel coming into the mayor's office um, uh, gave a, a few interviews uh, in the run up to, uh, to the election and, and, and to his installation. Um, and he, he laid out something uh, of, of what he thought his vision was going to be. It's not clear whether that, whether the cultural plan will, will uh, necessarily follow that. But just, uh, just so to get, get you up to speed on what he was saying in these interviews, and these are all quotes. Uh, and these quotes, uh, I should say, follow one from the other, uh, you know, sentence by sentence in the interview. So, so uh, I slowed them down so we could parse them just a little bit uh, because uh, Ram talked quickly and always talks quickly. And, and, and uh, one idea, each sentence has a, a, a very different spin, uh, different set of ideas. So, so quickly to take these apart, the first thing he says is, I want to create a spirit or sense that Chicago is a sophisticated city culturally and is arts and culture-wise very friendly. Um, so a focus on... Um, uh, uh, on sophistication uh, and, and, and uh, on, on the image of the city that you, it wants to present to the outside world. But um, unlike the uh, Millennium Park, which also is presenting an, an image to the, to the world, uh, his next sentence is to correct what, what the listener might think, which is that, oh, you're going to do more, more big projects. I love the art institute. I love the Illyric Opera. But louder than a bomb is in that lake. What I saw at the double door the other night, it's in that lake. Uh, so, so music clubs, uh, for-profit arts, small businesses are, 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 are being brought into the mix here in a way that they weren't uh, in, uh, for the most part, under Daly. Um, what is, why, what's the objective driving this? Obviously, there's economic concerns that the city has, uh, and that means recognizing that culture is, an, is primarily there for economic reasons, of interest to the city for economic reasons, not for political reasons, not, for, not to bind together communities uh, uh, or, or uh, produce civic uh, pride. But we are the city that generates, I think, a billion dollars of economic activity just on music alone. And uh, that came directly out of the study that, that, that we did. Uh, uh, and so, so, so Ram is thinking in these terms, city marketing, but also revenue generating. Uh, and then uh, the next swerve is to say, uh, it's, it's not just because the, the industry is big that we like it, it's because it brings in tourist revenues in particular, right? Outside New York and LA, Chicago is the, the destination for music. And the reason it brings in uh, uh, outsiders, he says, is that we have a rich history. You don't have the blues without Chicago. And then immediately compare us to other cities in the region with, for whom we're competing for possible tourists who might want to go see, see uh, hear the blues, right? So you could go to Memphis, but why go to Memphis when you could come to Chicago, even though we don't have a, a blues district, but and Memphis does, right? So uh, that's left unsaid. But that seem, that the implication there is that you know we've got something that Chicago does that that, that these other cities don't have. We're better than them, and we we should be competing on. Uh, uh, with them for tourist dollars. So um, the next thing he says is that we, he floats the idea of Chicago Music District, which gets um, uh, Jim DeRogatis very excited um, and, and others. So, so why the shift? As I said before, and we all know this, there's no money to support large building projects. And uh, in, in that kind of a uh, constrained policymaking situation, other tools of government action come to the fore. You say, what, what else can I do? I can do small, I can, I, I can't give money, but I can give uh, tax exemptions. I can, I can make it easier for small businesses to form, uh, help the licensing project process, uh, and so forth. And I can also uh, uh, sell the city to outsiders because information is a cheap uh, tool. It's much cheaper than building, building a wing. Um, the second reason, though, I think it's also important to recognize that, that uh, Rahm, like many other mayors, is uh, working on the basis of a new uh, set of theories about what spurs urban growth. Um, uh, uh, there, and there are several different variants of these, so I, I think it's important for us to get straight the distinctions between uh, the variants so that uh, you know, we can uh, have a clearer sense of what the policy alternatives are within this, this general framework of uh, new urban growth theory. So the first, uh, the first general principle seems to be that 
uh, at least one way to think about it, is that, that urban cultural growth is based on geographical factors, most important of which is that if firms clump together, uh, similar firms clump to, tend, do tend to clump together, and uh, firms in uh, related industries also tend to, tend, to clump, uh, tend to form clusters. And then finally, human capital is uh, is, a, is a factor that is, uh, that is mobile, so that uh, if you're going to think about urban policy, you need to take account of human capital. These are three different, three different aspects of, the, of urban growth theory, or three different uh, strands, right? So the agglomeration um, approach is evident in the story that you might have seen in the New York Times about the iPhone, iPhone, uh, the iPhone in China, um, uh, industrial uh, uh, activity, and Paul Krugman uh, was very happy to see this because he said, you know, he pointed out this vindicated his his uh, theory of economic growth, which is uh, really the, at, at the most basic level this agglomeration theory, which is that firms stand or fall not just on their own merits, but because they do or do not have a surrounding cluster of related firms that are suppliers or customers uh, that provide a ready pool of labor and so forth. Right. So basic. This has to do with manufacturing firms, but you could apply it to to firms in 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 other industries perhaps. Um, uh, the important thing to see here is that, that, that what counts here is you've got firms that are supplying uh, intermediate goods to each other in a supply chain that's, that's all about production, not about distribution or consumption. It's about where the stuff gets made, not where it gets sold. Yes? So there are, there are advantages of this that include increased productivity, innovation, and so forth uh, that, are, that are due to these various different causes. Um, uh, uh, and I'm not going to I'm not going to go through this, but if anybody's interested, you can come up later. So, uh, cultural industries then could be thought of as an example of agglomeration economies. Uh, there are there are a number of different studies. Elizabeth Curd, uh, Ed Glazer, and uh, Scott on on LA. So so and they, and they have focused on cultural industries that locate collate collate co-locating firms uh, inside uh, cities. Uh, usually in particular neighborhoods. If you go to New York, there's 47th Street where the guitars, all the guitar stores are. You know, if, you, if you're into guitars, you know that, uh, that this, 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 this does happen. Uh, but fashion industry on 7th Avenue and so forth. Okay. So if you, if you ask, well, does that, is that the case for Chicago? And one of the ways to make that visible would be to just map all the arts-related businesses. This is American for the Arts um, uh, showing us uh, how, uh, how uh, uh, much like a petri dish, Chicago looks, uh, and, and there's a lot of there's there, there's clearly an uneven uneven distribution of arts firms in the city. So, if you just looked at that, you'd say yes, agglomeration is certainly a factor uh, in uh, the industry. Just to, uh, a, a little side note, since I've been talking about industry, what what if you're going to think about what the music industry is a subcomponent of the arts was? Uh, one way to think about it would be uh, structurally as having these various elements with the, mus uh, the musicians at one end and the consumers at the other, but all these uh, different um, uh, chains between uh, and intermediary um, businesses that operate but in, in between the musician and, uh, and, and the consumers. Uh, and so if you're interested in an industrial approach, you'd want an industrial organization approach, you'd want to sort of look at all these different industries, uh, uh, industrial categories together, uh, and, um, uh, and then Try to think about how the, how they relate to each other and what kinds of revenue they produce and uh, jobs they produce. Yes. Um, so some basic st statistics. Uh, if you if you look at the number of artists that are employed, we're fifth among metro areas, which is um, pretty good, but not as good as it should be since we're third in population. Um, we have twice as many uh, professionally employed musicians as Seattle does, uh, and ten times as many professionally employed musicians as Austin does. Um, now, it's important to, uh, to note that what we're talking about here is people who are in the, uh, uh, the business uh, data sets. That, that, that is to say, these are people who work for uh, and get a regular paycheck uh, and, and uh, full-time you know, or part-time employees of, uh, of businesses. So it doesn't include uh, independent musicians. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's kind of interesting that we're, we're, we're so much uh, bigger than, than Seattle and Austin, even though everybody thinks of Seattle and Austin as music cities. Um, uh, the core component is 13,000 people, 800 businesses, third largest number of bi music businesses, and the third largest payroll. Okay, so payroll, employment, et cetera, right? It's also interesting that sound recording uh, studios are, are actually uh, a big part of the, uh, or were back in 2007, 
Uh, they may have there may have been a precipitous decline since then due to the changes in technology. But but you know you think of Nashville as uh, as being so much about recording. But if you actually just looked at the recording industry in Chicago and studios, you'd say, well, Chicago and Nashville are pretty close to each other. And it, but nobody nobody thinks, oh, Chicago is the place where music gets gets recorded. Um, I don't have that slide up, and I can't. I can't remember right now. But it, I, I think it. I, I'm thinking it might be um, um, uh, the place where Disney, Orlando, Florida, uh, Disney World, right, uh, or, and Las Vegas, because there there's so much um, straightforward employment there. Okay. So um, this is a nice chart that was done by uh, Richard Florida and and others up at Toronto, um, showing the agglomeration in the music industry. Can you can you make that out, or should I turn the lights off? Maybe a little bit dark, um, but as you can see, there the uh, this this is using location quotients, which me measures the concentration uh, in firms by by met, uh, different different uh, um, metro areas, I think. Uh, and, and you know, you can see some some interesting features here, things that you don't you wouldn't think would be the case. Stanford, Bloomington, um, Myrtle Beach. I don't, I have not, I'm not sure what Myrtle Beach is doing on there, but there's some oddities here. You know, just based on intuition, which leads you to start start asking, well, what are they what are they counting? But in any case, there there certainly are um, some places that, that are much more concentrated. Uh, Florida's argument is is that this is uh, this is illustrating just basic uh, brutal facts of agglomeration economies. And he and 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 he has shown that since 1970, uh, uh, between 1970 and 2000, there's been more an increasing concentration. Of music firms in the largest, uh, uh, the, the largest, the place that already had had more people working there. So that so the idea that more people will come, if you already have a lot of people, more m m a lot of firms, more firms will come, um, as well as as people. Right. Same same thing here, uh, in terms of the the recording industry. It's a little bit harder to see, but you can see how how huge Nashville is compared with everybody else. Um, okay. So why is Chicago doing so well in attracting employed musicians? Well, one. Uh, one one reason is just uh, at, like most economies, if you have a large market and you have um, other things that that, music, that that people who would also get jobs in that market can do, that will attract more uh, more workers to that market. Uh, economies of scale and economies of scope. And uh, when you're talking about employed musicians, uh, they're usually working for uh, businesses that have large fixed costs. And basic economy, economics also says that if you, if uh, if if the uh, industry has large fixed costs, that will give an advantage to economies of scale, obviously, because you can afford the the large fixed costs that it takes to get to, to enter the market in the first place. Yeah. Um, a third thing that that Florida and Stellaric also are saying is that uh, one reason why these there, there's an increased concentration is that the music industry is shifting its central for uh, its central revenue stream. From recording to a live performance, and if you're making your money off of audiences rather than off of CD buyers, then the places that have larger uh, publics are, are going to are going to do better since there's more work for uh, more people to buy the product in those areas. Um, but that still still leaves the question open of how do you know whether agglomeration of cultural industries is is uh, is paying off beyond the fact that people just tend to Joined to get clumped together, uh, looking for work in those industries. How do you know whether all this money that Bon Jovi and James Taylor and Carole King, et cetera, are making uh, is uh, is more than they would otherwise be making if there wasn't agglomeration? Um, one of the ways of getting at that is economic impact studies, um, and um, what these do, as most of you we all know by now, given the stimulus package, is that uh, if you inject money, uh, uh, funding into an economy, invest in it. Then uh, there, uh, and if, if money is being invested in a business as well, that uh, should have uh, uh, that that dollar should pass through the local economy, and get get paid to somebody else who would pay, pay somebody else, and you can therefore uh, develop multiplier estimates that um, show that if you have uh, the music industry in place in the city, that that's going to uh, those people are going to spend their dollars here to a certain extent, and uh, and these are frequently used by arts organizations. Um, there's a handy dandy arts and economic prosperity calendar put out by the uh, uh, Americans for the Arts, where you can just 
plop in your, your population, your total expenses, and your attendance, and, and, and it'll, it'll spit out the, uh, the information. Now, uh, and, and this is of great value if you're trying to go to your local legislator and get them to support, your, uh, support the arts in your community, which is why it's done. But obviously, as a, um, uh, uh, as a, uh, you know, a, as an, a, a piece, a bit of social science, it's kind of, it's sort of hard to believe that that you you would be able to get this right without thinking about other factors that that affect uh, how people spend their money, what other what other mark, you know, what other things do people do with their money in Chicago as opposed to other places and so forth. But in any case, this has been used in almost all the city level studies of the music industry uh, that have come out, and, and we've got them for Austin, Nashville, and Seattle among others. Um, so uh, if you think about the, the, the shortcomings of this methodology, it works very well if you've got, if you're making um, uh, uh, you know, widgets and you have a, uh, and, the or, and, and people know how to make the widget and they're, they're settled firms that are in long-term contracts with other firms uh, so that it's pretty clear that when you make this widget, you're gonna have to buy this or that from, from this company. Um, so the pr prices are relatively stable and so forth. Um, uh, and it also helps if the, if the investment of money is large. But none of these things are true for the arts. So uh, we know that the arts are very oddly organized. Uh, Richard Caves has famously said uh, uh, in, in uh, this cultural industries book, um, which I encourage everybody to read, that, that uh, nobody knows. The, the principles that govern, govern the, co the way contracts are made in, in the arts are, are, are the opposite of the way that they're, they're opposite of the principles that normally govern uh, 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 industrial organization. Prices are not stable, and the flow of investment is uh, is is very uncertain. Right. So, so the result of that, and this is something that uh, Don Corsi here in the Harris School actually went out and looked at, it, and uh, he produced a list, which he, unfortunately I couldn't get from him for today. But basically, he listed all the multipliers that that were used in these different studies, and they they vary by a factor of ten. So. So, so it's th this, the information in these economic impact studies is very, very iffy for the arts. Not to mention that they're incredibly expensive to do these studies. Um, um, let's see, this is not moving for me. The light seems to have turned off. Um, okay, let's see if I can, yeah. So, so why are there so many of these studies? Well, um, you know, you, people, advocates for the arts are competing with with uh, advocates for funding from other sectors, and they need they need to to, to look like grown-ups in the way that other sectors look like grown-ups, uh, and, and uh, especially now when there there are, are big budget fights for um, general funding, um, you'll get people like the head of the NEA talking about um, arts as an economy and artists as as workers, and this is a jobs program just like any other program, uh, and there, and we need to show that it's a jobs program that's worth uh, spending government money on. Um, uh, and then the last thing, of course, is if, in fact, politicians tend to s want to support the arts for reasons that have nothing to do with economic reasons, but they need to be able to pretend that they're, 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 they're supporting the arts for economic reasons. So we had a meeting on this a few years ago, and one of the participants, one of the heads of the art, arts agency said, uh, she was told by a politician who wanted to push for a uh, budget for, for the arts. It doesn't matter whether it's right, all I need is a number, any number. Um, so so it, 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 it's very depressing for people in academia to hear this, but, uh, but we live with it. In any case, we were approached by the Chicago Music Commission back in 2006 uh, and asked uh, if we could do an economic impact study. Uh, and I'm not gonna tell you how much they had to spend, but I will say it was, it, 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 it would have been impossible to do an economic impact study for the amount of money that they had, but it was possible for us to do um, something else, which was just uh, do what we wanted to do because we didn't believe in economic impact studies for the reasons uh, that I said, said before, which is to just look at more basic um, economic indicators. Um, but what we, one of the things we did, we were able to do, uh, that's not an economic impact analysis, but in fact is probably more, uh, more interesting is um, uh, to, we, we gather statistics on 50 different metropolitan areas uh, on the music industry, employment, uh, firm, uh, number of firms, and so forth. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and so we were able to compare across 50 different metropolitan areas. And we were able to do some regressions um, where we tested the question of whether uh, music employment actually increased um, overall employment in the metropolitan area at the county level, 
right? So, so the question is, if you have, if you have um, uh, a lot of music jobs more compared to other places, does that mean, does that show up, does that affect the creation of jobs in things that have nothing to do with music? Yeah? And, and, and of course, we know that per capita income affects employment rates, uh, crime, the crime rate, and the number of college graduates do. So we included these as variables. But we found that even when you took those into account, that the local music employment correlated with a small net increase in overall employment. So, so, and that's at the county level, which is a very low level, right? Uh, and so that's that's very. It's a small increase, but it's statistically significant, which is, you know, we, we thought was very was not going to happen because we're talking about very small numbers of firms. You know, uh, to, to to for it to be significant, it would have to be uh, at all. It would have it would be quite amazing. But uh, and, and much more research needs to be done. And it's very suggestive, however, that um, music employment turned out to have more of an impact on empl overall employment than the cr uh, than the crime rate, and was as strong as per capita income in, in in predicting that there would be an increase in local employment. Okay, um, so. That's one. That's one motion, notion of, of growth theory. Just look at the that the that the number of people in the in the in the area who are in in the industry, uh, and ask are large ones better than small ones. Uh, uh, the second theory, is, however, has to do with the idea that uh, it's not a matter of how how big the industry is, but it's a matter of well, of of innovation uh, being fostered by uh, the presence of uh, of of large numbers of firms, right? So, so, uh, it's not, so it's not just a matter of there being a lot of firms, but also there being firms of, that are in different industries that end up um, uh, learning from each other and, and, and creating um, uh, you know, new and better products. Right? Um, and, and this is based, on, again, on the, on the idea that, that what really counts in an industry are the ideas that flow between, uh, between the firms, not the money, not the contracts, but the ideas. Right, so they're not going to be captured directly in, in economic statistics, but they are going to be captured long term in whether a company innovates and, and grows. Um, and, and if you add to that the notion that knowledge workers who bear this capital that they can share with other people are, are, are capable of moving from one city to another uh, because they carry their capital in their heads for, mostly, for the most part. There are, there are no, no fixed costs really for them. Uh, then the question is how do you attract how do you attract these? Um, uh, how do you attract human capital? Um, so one approach is has been to invest directly in innovation hubs. We know that they're high tech. You know, people want to have their own high tech corridors. They want to next Silicon Valley. Um, uh, so you give tax breaks to high tech firms. You support the universities, um, and you you try to create these um, knowledge intensive industry hubs. Now there's a variant of that in cultural policy, which is to invest in artistic operations because you define and, and then you argue uh, to, the, uh, to the state that artists really are knowledge workers and, and they are really the purest creatives. Uh, and if you, want, if you want creativity in high tech, you need to have more artists in, in, in Chicago. Right? So uh, they provide what Ann Markson will call an artistic dividend. Uh, and I'm sure she'll have something to say when she, uh, about that when she gets here. Uh, they'll be able to also create things that are exporting uh, uh, goods that are that are new and uh, are going to help the economy, but they're also going to uh, help um, uh, stimulate uh, cr other firms in other areas of what is now being called the creative economy, right? So we know that creatives uh, already cluster. Um, uh, we have uh, Rich Lloyd on Wicker Park. We've got Jane Jacobs famously on Greenwich Village and more generally on, on ecologies of innovation. Um, Elizabeth Curd has written about the New York art, art scene and music scene uh, coming together. Um, so, uh, but, but as a matter of policy, uh, it, it, there, have been, there have been a number of efforts by cities in the last few years to try to, to, try to do this self-consciously. One of these is the Cermak Creative Industry District, um, which, um, land, uh, in which the city um, uh, worked with uh, local developers uh, uh, turning four landmark historic buildings into incubators, where, which were supposed to uh, in, include all these different um, uh, industry, uh, cultural uh, uh, industries uh, in, in the buildings. So they'd be sort of living together, and maybe they would run into each other in the hall, and who knows what would happen. 
And that was, that was the vision uh, on, that was sold to the city. I'm not going to go into the, any details about what happened to that project. Um, uh, and, it, and it may have changed since the last time I looked at it. So uh, if people have any information later, we can, we can talk about it. I just want to flag it as something that more recently Chicago has tried to do in addition to the um, Cows on Parade and, and uh, the Millennium Park. Um, but of course, uh, you know, there are, there are a, lot of, a lot of doubters uh, who, who look at this stuff and say, this is ridiculous. Um, it's very unlikely that artists are really going to be you know, uh, saying anything that's going to change the way that, that the, uh, the junk bond uh, uh, traders uh, uh, work, right, uh, or, 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 or the financial uh, uh, analysts and so forth. And high-tech workers really are not going to learn much from, from jazz musicians. So, so that, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's very unclear whether, whether there's any payoff for this. Um, and theoretically, there, there seems to be, it seems to be quite a, quite a jump. Um, the fact is, that, however, that we know that most artists uh, are, are, you know, meet people who are not artists, um, uh, not, uh, in, not when they're in the, in, in the middle of um, making products and trying to figure out what they're going to, you know, or, or trying to figure out what they're going to play, right? Uh, but, but actually delivering the product to, to the audience. So you, meet, you mostly meet musicians when you go to the club. You don't meet them in the CD uh, factory or, or the pirate CD factory, as, as this is in this case. Um, so there's another way to think about this, which is the way that I, I, uh, that I want to focus on for the rest of the talk, which is to think about culture less as an industry than as, than as a scene or as an amenity. Um, uh, uh, and that's based on the assumption that uh, if, you're, if you're interested in attracting non-arts knowledge workers, it's culture as an amenity that, that uh, is going to count. So they're not going to care whether they're publishers in Chicago, they're they're going to want to they're going to look at Hyde Park and say, oh look at the, all these bookstores I can go to, right? They're not going to care that Nashville has a lot of recording studios, and there are other cities that have a lot of recording studios but have no live music, uh, uh, and, and nobody goes there. Now, nobody's going to want to move there except for people who want to make recordings. So so it, it makes sense uh, to focus if you're going to focus on policy, I think, uh, and on measuring the impact of policy um, on um, on, on the part of the cultural industry that is uh, in, where the rubber meets the road, where, where, where audiences meet the producers in the actual uh, live uh, part of, uh, of, uh, of, of culture. Right? Uh, and and the, the last thing that needs to be said about this, however, is that uh, it, it's very seldom the case that people move to, from one, will, will decide to move from one city to another based on the presence of a single um, cultural uh, provider. There's a famous story about Boeing wanting to come to Chicago because of the the opera, yeah, right? So, so that may that may be that may work, uh, you know, <coughs> anecdotally for for some. But for most people, when they come to look at a city and try to decide where they want to live there, they're thinking about what it feels like to you know to go to a particular neighborhood. They want to be able to 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 have access to to many different kinds of of uh, of opportunities and. And so it's important to think about bundles rather than uh, individual uh, uh, arts organizations or even individual um, arts um, categories. That's, and, and even to think about arts as part of a larger category called entertainment. All right, so the restaurant, the restaurant business may be as important. You know, the, the fact that, that foodies uh, know that Chicago is a great place to, f you can, that there's hot dogs and semitas pueblas uh, as well as the lyric opera uh, is is important to you know to, to to some people at least in deciding to come here. So if you want to look at this, you probably want to look at it as holistically as possible. That cr leads to an, the the interesting problem, which is how do you actually go about studying this stuff? How do you measure uh, the art scene in a city? So if you if you want to start with the basic stuff that that people in the Harris School tend to look at is these. You know, this, you, 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 can, you can look at census data and, and you can say, well, how many dancers are there, uh, you know, in, uh, around the country? And what place has the most dancers? And the answer is, uh, you'll spit out a zip code in northwestern Illinois, Indiana. And the reason is that in northwest Indiana, there are a lot of strip clubs. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of people who are exotic dancers who are, who are working in strip clubs in northwest Indiana. Uh, and this is true. So, so this is a... 
this, this makes this data not so, not so good, not so useful, uh, because the categories are not, are not granular enough to get at what, you know, what, at this difference, which you know, is of some, some interest to people who are deciding to move somewhere. Some people might prefer to go to the strip clubs. Other people might go to prefer Hubbard Street. Um, so uh, one of the parts of the study, in addition to the, to the basic statistics that we, we, we decided to take on, was to try to look at the music scene in particular and ask, can we measure the things that would count in a live music scene that would, make, that, that would, that would allow us to distinguish Chicago from other cities? Uh, and that we know intuitively when we, when, because we live here and visit other cities, but can we put numbers on these? So um, uh, you, you can begin by looking at the distinction between uh, the number of uh, people who are employed, which is over here on the left, and you can see Chicago is way behind uh, LA and New York. Um, we have about a third the number of employees. But if you look at the number of live performances that we offer, we're not so bad, right? We're, 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 we're in the ballpark. So, so, so it's not necessarily the case that we're worse than New York uh, be, because we have uh, fewer musicians, because what you care about if you're assigned to come here is, is there music to, you know, showing for me to, to go to? So, so how do we flesh these out? Well, we, we look at the following things. We, we decide, let's see if there are measures of quality. Let's see if there are measures of, the var of variety. How many different kinds of music are available? Uh, is music, can I get into a show? Uh, can I afford to go? You know, uh, how, are, are there seats available? Um, are, are, are the, is the music in the city um, concentrated or spread out? Um, is it walkable or not? It would be another way of saying that. Um, and then, are, you know, what is the local flavor like? Is there, is there a grassroots uh, are, you know, are there a lot of, are there a lot, it, 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 is, is it just made up of uh, people who, who are employed in, uh, you know, by, by uh, 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 have long standing gigs, or are there a lot of musicians who are playing um, locally uh, for, you know, on open mic night and so forth uh, that, that, that would form a kind of uh, grassroots uh, level of the scene that might be, that might give it a kind of uh, buzz that you don't get if you, in, in say, Las Vegas. So, so uh, well, starting with quality, uh, you know, ask the question, how good is music? And everybody starts getting worried. Uh, and they say, you're gonna, who's going to decide that? It's subjective. Um, uh, but there are, there are ways of thinking about this uh, in which you can aggregate subjective preferences. One is just to look at uh, popularity, right? So, so if people are buying a lot of, uh, a lot of recordings from the bands that are, uh, uh, that are performing in your city, right? Then you could say that, that your city is 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 uh, uh, offering music that is that, that the general public finds uh, is of high quality because they're buying they're 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 uh, uh, revealing their preferences by actually buying these CDs. Yeah. So we took the Billboard year end, we could look at the Billboard year end charts and the top 100 uh, groups and we could ask well how many of those groups actually perform in Chicago. Uh, we could also look at critically. Uh, we could ask, well, you know, maybe maybe one 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 way of measuring quality is whether people a lot of people like the bands. Another thing, my to, way to measure quality, which of course anybody who who cares about quality would would prefer, would be not not to not to go by what the popular taste is, but by go by what the best informed taste is. And so uh, uh, you could you know so then you say well. Everybody's a critic, but um, uh, not everybody is a is a professional critic. And we're very lucky because the Village Voice uh, every year puts out a poll in which they ask 800 uh, different critics um, to give their top 10 lists. So you can you have you have something you have something closer that to a critical um, consensus. Uh, or you have a way of at least measuring what what people who are professional critics say are the are the good uh, performers for that year. Okay. So uh, we know that Chicago uh, cares about, a lot about quality. Uh, and we know this because, well, because we're, we live here. Uh, but it's, it's not just, it, it, it's, uh, it's also seems to be something that has been granted by New York Times music critics. Uh, since this one actually says that, you know, the most studious even analytical crowd of any American rock festival uh, comes to Pitchfork. And, you know, the way we express our, our, our approbations by saying, you're pretty good. Um, 
So, so we are the picky few. There, Chicago does seem to. There's something about Chicago that, that at least for New York critics, seems to indicate that uh, we we encourage the uh, uh, this kind of discrimination, which is very nice to nice for them to say. I'm not sure if it's how true it is, but we could test how true it is by uh, by looking at uh, both the Billboard Top 100, which remember will will um, uh, track how uh, how uh, popular the artists are that come to your city, and uh, the Village Voice Top 100, which is the gray one, which tracks how um, uh, critically acclaimed are the are the bands that are performing in Chicago. Okay, and if you look at this, it's a very it's an interesting uh, statistics. You, you can see that the Chicago, LA, and New York are um, uh, uh, you know uh, the big three obviously are are are, are, are have ha, uh, uh, economies of scale that also mean that every almost everybody is going to come and perform in um, was on the top 148 out of the 50 for Chicago, 49 out of 50 uh, for New York, right? So so, um, uh, uh, so 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 that that that's one advantage that big cities have. But then when you look at the uh, Village Voice top 100, New York only had 34 out of those people uh, of those bands perform in New York. So actually, this is a better city if you're interested in in uh, the hip bands, I guess you could say. Um, uh, you, you could make an argument if you were trying to persuade somebody who's a music uh, fan to, to come live in Chicago based on this chart, because we actually we get almost all of them. Um, we get more than anybody else of the top uh, uh, 100 Village Voice bands, um, if you're interested in that kind of music. Yeah. OK, so that's one, one way of thinking about it, quality. Um, the, another another way of asking is the music scene good here is how much variety is there? Um, are there uh, is, is is the city uh, a place where you can seek out um, uh, I don't know soca music or uh, Tibetan <coughs> Tibetan music? Right? Are, are there lots of different kinds of specialized clubs that focus on one? Style of music, or, or is the club? Are the clubs here basically? They're all they're all playing kind of generic rock and roll, yeah. Uh, and we can we can uh, we know that this is an important feature uh, for um, at least uh, college educated um, uh, individuals because of the work of uh, Richard Peterson and others uh, on uh, on tastes, uh, in which Peterson studied. Uh, uh, well, um, Peterson uh, uh, showed that that uh, uh, that the uh, the number of different kinds of uh, genres uh, of uh, of art uh, activity that that a person uh, listed themselves as being interested in um, uh, was correlated with college uh, uh, edu educational level. So that that is to say, if if you go to college, what you what you learn to do is make distinctions, and you learn that distinctions are part of what what uh, get, gets you a job, and therefore you you learn to know a little bit about lots of different kinds of things. Right? And this is a big change, by the way, since 1960, when it used to be the case that if you went to college, you, you went to college in order to learn about opera and you know uh, uh, and symphony and, and and museums. Now, when you go to college, you learn about opera, symphony, museums. But you also learn to take a class on the blues, and you take a class on jazz. Right? And the idea here is that, that the, the, the more education you have, the more of these different areas you'll, you'll be a, uh, a cognoscenti in, yeah? an aficionado. Yes? So, so it's important to think about variety uh, in, in terms of attracting college graduates for, uh, for that reason. This is, this is actually what Austin does, is they have, um, you can select a genre of music and the style of music, and there's a a list of genres, and you can uh, uh, mix and match and say, I want to go to see this genre with this style uh, 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 of music. And because they're trying to, to recognize that the, that, uh, the taste for variety is, is an important part of what makes, uh, makes them what they are. So, so you know, Austin would be a case where they're actually deliberately, they're really interested in showing that there's a lot of different kinds of things to see. In Memphis, you've got a street that is all you know, it's BB King's. It's all. It's all about the origin of the blues, and so every club is is a blues club. Now that can also be attractive as well. But simply to try to figure out what is it, what you know, how many different genres of music are represented on the music scene in the city, I think is an important thing to think about. So this is what we did: was 
um, we were able to, um, um, thanks to the fact that there's this directory that where, where clubs were asked, were allowed to, to, to name what kind of musics they had in them. Um, uh, this is what, what Chicago's looks like. Um, you can see there's quite a few different um, kinds of uh, specialized music clubs um, that, that, that focus on particular kinds of music. Um, and then when you, when you compare us with other cities, you see that, as you might expect, Nashville has, I don't know if you can see the lines here, but almost all of this is country, right? And that, that's as you might expect, Nashville's capital of country music. Um, so if you go to Nashville, you better like country music, right? If you want to, if you want to hear um, uh, reggae, uh, or you want to hear uh, swing music, or you want to hear um, uh, alternative music, you're not going to, you're not going to get that in Nashville. Yeah. Um, Seattle, interesting, has has almost as many different categories, but most of their most of their clubs are unspecified. Whereas whereas our we have we have more clubs, you could say, that are interested in, in specialized music, a, a greater percentage of clubs that are interested in specialized music as well um, than Seattle. Okay? Larry, are those yeah. self-designations? Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, because this is a this is from the um, uh, this directory that we, we uh, I don't know if we can read it. We're, yeah, the talent buyers directory from 2004, so it's out of date uh, at this point, but, but it, g it gives you a snapshot from 2004, and, and that, that's a directory that the clubs themselves subscribe to, and the idea is to try to, I mean, they're, they're listing themselves in, in that way because they're, they're trying to tell, tell the talent buyers uh, that they should send their bands to this, you know, to, to see if they can get, to contact them to get jobs. Um, this is a very complicated chart, but I just thought it was worth uh, showing you uh, the top pie charts. Um, if you look at Las Vegas, uh, that gives you the extreme version. Uh, uh, Atlanta is, it has fewer um, categories, but uh, also fewer that are just generic uh, clubs than we do. But we're, we're, so we're, we're, we have a nice spread of lots of different kinds of music. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and a large piece of the pie that's devoted to that. OK, so third, third factor in thinking about what makes a scene lively, in addition to quality and variety, is um, walkability, you could say. Um, or or whether, whether you feel that there's just, whether the clubs are, uh, are, are visible to you as a scene. Right? You can have an individual club, uh, but it's not the same thing as having Beale Street. Yes. So this is uh, the late lamented original checkerboard lounge. Anybody ever go to this? Besides Barry, of course. And yeah, I mean, uh, it was a great place to hear music, um, uh, but it was there was they, they they had not developed the neighborhood around it, and uh, it was uh, I mean, it was a little scary at night. You had to be walk your car by guys. At least I did. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, but it was a wonderful place to hear music, um, and it could have been. It, it, I think it could have been. Uh, built built around, but instead it got closed down. Um, one of the things we did uh, that I, I don't think we would have to do anymore now that Google Maps has grown up, uh, but in those days we, we had to do it ourselves, uh, was to map the geographic distribution of music venues in Chicago. And <clears throat> um, uh, in order to, to, to make visible uh, you know, wh uh, what, what we have an intuition of, which is that if you're in Chicago and you want to go hear music, uh, it's it's relatively spread out. Um, uh, there 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 are a few clusters over here, uh, but there are also a lot that are along lo these long avenues that we've got here, right? So so they're strung out like beads. Um, if you compare New York to Chicago, you can see how different that is. Um, and this reflects uh, th these these clusters are all around subway subway stations. Um, so, and there are a lot of subway stations in Manhattan, obviously, but um, you know this this contributes to the to, to the feeling that you get in New York when you go to certain parts of the city that there's a lot of there's a lot of nightlife there, a lot of a lot of club life. New Orleans, of course, has this you know everything uh, within the French Quarter uh, and very little outside. Okay, last but not least is <clears throat> um, uh, accessibility. So. So you know, it's, a, it's one thing to say you've got a lot of music. That's another thing to say, and, 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 and that it's high quality, and that there's a lot of variety. But 
if you can't afford to go to the shows, uh, 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 or even if you can afford it, you can never get a seat. It's it's uh, the scene is going to be less uh, less interesting than it would otherwise. Or if there are too many seats, the scene is going to be less interesting than it would otherwise be. Right. So because when you go to your experience in, in in going to these clubs is that you want there to be a lot of people, but you don't want to be shut out. You want you want to be on the outside. You want to be able to get in. So can I afford it? Can I get a seat? Um, what we were able to do was to look at the um, the low end uh, median ticket prices, and turns out Chicago is really a cheap place, you know, a great place if you want to be able to, you know, if you're just out of college and you don't have that much money, uh, the average ticket price is, is, is lower than it is in Austin, um, which, you know, uh, uh, which is quite, quite interesting um, for all artists. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's cheaper than Las Vegas, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, so, so this is an interesting statistic. And could could be used for city marketing. Uh, any questions? Okay. Um, we also wanted to know whether it's possible, you know, wh whether you're likely to get in um, for the uh, uh, the Billboard Top 100. Uh, we we sell out we, at least in 2007. Every seat was sold, so you're not going to be able to get tickets to Lady Gaga uh, very easily in Chicago, and that's a function of the size of the market. But it's uh, but but 89% of the seats. Uh, in the Village Voice uh, bands uh, were sold, which is which is good uh, because it's robust and a lot better than going to a show, say in New Orleans, where you know about half the seats will be empty, even for these great bands. Because so you, your experience will be uh, maybe a little bit depressing if you go and uh, go to see these these hipster bands in, in New Orleans, uh, whereas here you'll you'll get a nice uh, 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 full house, but you'll still be able to get in. Is that, is that the um, potential tickets sold aggregated, or it's the percentage of the shows themselves that are actually sold out? Uh, this is the percentage uh, of shows that have sold out. Yeah, we have other we have other information about the number of seats that were that were sold per show, but I'm not going to show that slide. Um, I, I wanted to give a big caveat, a couple of big caveats about this data. Um, we did not include. Uh, we didn't have, to have information on on the scene aspects for th symphony, symphonies, opera, old town school, because they were not in these uh, uh, in these particular um, data sets. And it would be important to add those in because obviously they're in a, a big part of what makes Chicago uh, an interesting city. Um, we also did not uh, do the statistics for the music festivals, which is a huge lacuna since uh, it's the uh, you know obviously a big part of what makes Chicago Chicago? Uh, one of the reasons we didn't do that was that the statistics, comparative statistics, are are very hard to come by uh, for the number of people who are attending festivals, since they're almost ver very often they're estimates um, that you know you can't rely on. Um, we also did not get uh, religious music and music in schools, and that again is an important, a big part of what goes on in Chicago. Some of it was captured in the employment statistics, but but um, the scene aspects were not. How many people, you know, uh, go to gospel shows and so forth were not. Um, also, the interest missing uh, from the statistics I've just shown was the entire uh, uh, spectrum of music making that goes on, done by peop by bands that are not um, uh, that haven't that haven't already made it, that aren't part of the top 100, uh, uh, and that aren't. Um, uh, also, you know, uh, critically acclaimed yet, but that are that are striving uh, and working in their garages, and 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 trying trying to make it. Um, so uh, the last piece I want to show you from the project has to do with that that area, which has been very understudied by uh, by the other uh, in the other studies that have focused on economic impact, but that we think is actually a big part of what gives the buzz to the to the city. Um, um, so we, 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 what we were able to do was uh, go to MySpace Music, and I should say that uh, this is a this is a uh, once in a lifetime possibility that we can we cannot do a follow up study on because uh, MySpace Music has declined dramatically as the as the go to site. But there was a there was a period back in the mid 2005 to 2007 period where everybody who had a band 
went to MySpace, pretty much everybody. I mean, it was, it was the place. Uh, that's no longer true. So we have a snapshot in time. But what, what it, 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 there's a lot of information here. And if anybody's interested in playing with it, um, there's a lot still to be done. And we can come and talk, talk about that afterwards. So what we did was we downloaded every band on MySpace music, which is you know like I, I don't know 24 million bands, or some insane number of bands. And the good thing about MySpace music is that it tells you, uh, the, the band tells you they, they say where they're from, so you can you can then say well how many bands are from Chicago, and they also um, tell you how many fans they have, uh, they and they tell you what genre they want to be called, they want people. They can name the genre that they and genres that they play. So, so uh, uh, just in terms of studying genres, uh, it, it's a fascinating thing because there, there, when I when we started downloading, there were something like 170 genres, and then when we by the time we'd finished downloading, 24 hours later, there were 180 genres, mm -hmm. because people keep inventing new names for what they do and trying to distinguish. So, so that's an interesting topic in its own right, but. Basic statistics are, are, are showing this. So Chicago, um, you know, you expect big cities to have more bands, right? Um, uh, uh, but it, it didn't turn out to be that way at all. Turns out LA doesn't really seem to be a place that promotes garage bands to play. There's not a lot of local music, uh, locally, locally produced, non-economically remunerative music, you could say. Uh, They've only got 5,000. We've got 10,000. New York has a huge number. But Boston also, interestingly, has, has a very large number. So that's, that's, this is interesting stuff. Nashville, of course, which is you know, the, the place that shows up in Richard Florida's uh, statistics as, uh, as the leading, you know, ca the capital of the music industry, uh, is, is, only has 2,000 uh, bands. OK. So if you, if you adjust this by population, uh, Austin's looking a little bit better. We're not looking quite as good. New Orleans starts to look to look very good, uh, and Seattle uh, also starts to look very good. Uh, so now there there are a couple of further things that we can do looking inside of this data, uh, and this is since this is stuff that we've done since the project uh, since the report. So this is new new stuff, and uh, this is done by Dan Silver, who's going to be coming next week. Uh, uh, was here at the time and worked on, on the music report along with Don and uh, Sarah Lee, who uh, uh, was a Harris School student at the time. Uh, so what Dan did was he, he, um, he looked at the cities that had uh, a lot of bands uh, 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 attached to them. And, um, uh, this is the total number of bands. Not, uh, I should say the statistic on the previous page has a f lower number because that one we, we took out the bands that had fewer than 50 fans. And we only looked at bands that were trying to make it commercially. Uh, but so this is all the bands, not just the, the bands with 50 or more fans. Uh, and uh, you know, LA, uh, Brooklyn uh, comes. Brooklyn and New York are, you know, have a huge number of, uh, of, of bands, and Chicago, as you might expect. So so this is the ranking. But then if you compare it with um, bands who have have, uh, if you if you add up the number of fans that are associated with these bands, right? So so fan, this this would be an indicator of uh, which cities have bands that are from that city that um, uh, uh, where, where, where those bands have a lot of fans? Yeah? So you could say, you know, people who have bands that have a lot of fans, uh, or cities that have bands that have a lot of fans, are likely to be places that people who care about music a lot, enough to become fans of the bands, are going to think of as a music city. So, so, so that, that, that's, this is one, one of the reasons for, for looking at this. Um, uh, if you compare Nashville uh, versus Portland, and you say, "Well, Nashville is great in country music, but is it is it really good in other kinds of music?" We saw with the music venues that it was very unweighted, right? That it had mo almost all country music venues. But if you look at the if you look at the rankings by genre, is Port you know so Nashville is in the top? Um, uh, well, twenty uh, fifth, you know, twenty five. Uh, rankings uh, for, for this many bands. If you look at, at Portland, Portland has more, more, than 20, more than twice as many categories of music in which uh, it's, it's got bands that a lot of fans think are, are great. Right? So, so 
this is one way of measuring the cosmopolitanism of, uh, of, of the cities. You could say, you know, uh, uh, Nashville is very uh, country-centric or, or provincial in, in other ways because it doesn't, people who in Nashville don't tend to want, uh, Nashville doesn't tend to produce bands that, that uh, also are, are, are of interest to people who are interested in, uh, in techno or, or, or Afrobeat. Um, okay. Um, and you can do this, the same kind of thing for uh, a number of fans by genre. Uh, and uh, here you can say, you, what this is showing is that some cities have uh, 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 an average rank uh, for, for, uh, for, their, for, 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 for these genres, which is, which is higher or lower, right? So, the, so a higher rank would, would mean that you've got a lot of different genres in which the bands there are well thought of. They're, they have a lot of fans, yes? So it's not just there, that there are a lot of bands that play this kind of music, but the best bands are, are associated, you know, in, in the best bands in, in, uh, uh, in hip hop are, are, are in LA, uh, but you know, Atlanta is number two, right? So, so, you could, so if you want to say, well, are, it, is, is the average score uh, in, in a, your city higher or lower? That would be an indication that you've got qu high quality in lots of different, different areas, or high fan interest at least. And you know, Chicago is, uh, has an average rank of almost, almost six, but Atlanta is you know, not, not doing as well in, in, in those terms either. Right? So this is another way of talking about variety and the quality of the variety that we've got. If you were to ask you know, specifically, if you're interested in, in thinking about what, what kinds of people uh, you want to have come to your city and you say, I want, I want to know whether, I, I want people who like emo music um, or, or uh, you know, uh, those are the people that I want to have come here. How can I, how can I tell whether we're doing, any, we're doing well or not in emo? Well, you can look at the number of bands. You can look at the bands that have, you know, a small number of fans. Um, uh, Chicago has a lot of band, has half as many bands, uh, uh, and a lot, a lot of them with a small number. But they also have um, more than twice as many emo bands that are like huge, huge. Uh, huge bands, at least 1,000 to 1, 1 million. Right, so this is the kind of thing you could play with. Uh, uh, now, it would only be a value, of course, if um, sorry, I, there's one. This is the latest thing off the off the um, the assembly line. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to even explain what this is. Um, it may be easier to look at this. Uh, what we did was we looked at the share of the city's music fans that are. Um, uh, that are uh, uh, interested in, in, in these different categories of music. So, so uh, you know, you could say in Las Vegas, almost everybody's interested in, in rock, and not much interested in these other, in these other genres. Whereas, um, you know, in LA, it's also more rock centric. But Chicago has a much more even distribution of fan interest. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just leave that aside. So, so, so uh, the next horizon then is to sort of ask the question about whether how does the music scene uh, connect to the cultural scene in the city overall? And then once we've s talked about that, we can ask: Do cultural scenes actually make any difference in terms of attracting uh, college graduates or um, uh, reducing crime rates or uh, anything else social sciencey that you'd that you'd want to ask if you're thinking about what culture does? Yes, politically, economically, um, socially. So, uh, but but in order to get there, you you have to sort of start asking uh, questions about how music is related to other cultural practices around the city and in, in at the neighborhood level. So one of the one question you could ask, for example, is, um, uh, is are, are cities are 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 certain genres of music uh, tied to bohemianism? In a neighborhood, and bohemianism is a is a is a term that Richard Florida uh, and and Rich, Rich Lloyd and others uh, have have uh, latched onto, and they've got their own measures for they've got their own index of bohemianism. So so we could start asking questions about whether uh, music uh, you know really f how does it fit? Uh, 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 there's also bo bobo, no brow, uh, and so forth, right? Um, uh, but in, uh, 
if you're going to do this right, uh, the right way to do this would be to, 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 to start asking questions um, not about the quality of, of the scene, um, uh, that is say, you know, do the critics like it or not, but to ask what it is that different kinds of art, including music, do for the people who, who pay money, uh, or, or if they don't pay money, at least go and have the experience. Yes? So, so this would mean saying, if, if, I, if I like a certain genre of music, what is that, why do I like that genre of music? What, is that, what, what appeals to me about, about the blues? Well, certainly, you know, if you read people who study the blues, they say the blues is about authenticity, uh, and it's about um, uh, it's it's not about glamorousness, right? But if I go to the opera, it's a lar large part about glamour. If I go to see Lady Gaga, rock and roll, it's about that's also about glamour. Um, uh, you know, so so there are a lot of different things that that attract people to cultural experiences. And so, if you really wanted to do this properly, uh, and this is part of a project that Terry. Clark and the sociology department is doing, along with Dan Silver, and that I was involved in uh, early on in trying to theorize. Uh, uh, the, what you need to do is to, to start from scratch if you want to do arts policy research. This is, our, this is the, the hypothesis, is that uh, the arts are about the experience, and the experience needs to be understood in terms of, of the categories of the, that, are, that, that people who do critical uh, theory have developed in talking about the aesthetic experience. And there are, there are many, many different kinds of value that you can associate. You can, you can say, I go to an experiment, uh, uh, I, go, I, go, I get involved in culture because I love, to see, I love to see them break the rules. I love it when Jim Morrison vomits on stage or, you know, or, or Iggy Pop you know, sort of puts a, puts a safety pin through his arm. Right? That, uh, I, that's, what I'm there, that's what I want. Or you can say, I go, I go to the square dance because I like, or, or I go to hear folk music because I feel that there's a neighborly equality and I feel that we're all together uh, uh, you know, in, a, in a kind of community. Those are very different things. So what you need to do if you want to study, uh, uh, study ask whether the arts are, are, are doing anything to people, I think you need to sort of step back and, uh, and, and look in those ways. You can have an argument about that. But in any case, I just want to sort of lay that down um, and just give you one last chart, which is, um, not about music anymore, but more generally about cultural scenes. So as, uh, one of the things we've, been, we've done is we, uh, and the music project is, is kind of a, a part of that, uh, is uh, we downloaded uh, every, every business uh, in the, uh, uh, in, in every zip code in the country that had, was in a category, a firm, that could in any way be thought of as being cultural, and that includes bar that, that includes um, barber shops because barber shops are, are are spaces where people meet and talk. They're not just places where you get a haircut. Boutiques, um, tattoo parlors, right? So uh, 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 storefront churches, right? Th uh, things that are uh, uh, things things that that signal uh, s cultural value of some kind, right? But also, of course, all the arts businesses. Bookstores, used bookstores. I mean, you can get you can get pretty pretty. So so then we ha we had a, about 180 categories of firm. For each of these categories, we coded the. We asked, well, is this is this something which is about? Is this a cultural experience about self-expressiveness? Is it about charisma? Is it is a char is charisma involved in the in, in the activity that you're involved in? If you go to a used bookstore, it's not about charisma, right? If you go to uh, 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 to uh, Sym Symphony Hall, it probably is about charisma. Um, is it about glamorousness or uh, uh, right? And so, so, so we had these different categories, and and then we were we we, we have forty two thousand zip codes, so we can take a zip code and we can say, well, what what if we add up all these different scores on these different um, categories, what 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 would the chart look like? So this is a chart that shows. Hyde Park. Oh, I, for some reason I blanked out there, but Hyde Park is the um, is this uh, fuchsia, I guess, is the color. I don't know what what uh, violet, I guess, right? Yeah, um, uh, is the violet one. So you can say uh, it, it looks very uh, low and utilitarian. There aren't a lot of um, uh, uh, places devoted to um, uh, teaching you how to do uh, one thing or another. Um, not much glamour. Uh, uh, 
this is rationality. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I think I think these are reversed. This this is this is, yeah. So so yeah. So 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 anyway, what 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 this shows is uh, that uh, if this if one of these is Wicker Park and the other one is Hyde Park, uh, it reflects the fact that Hyde Park doesn't feel anything like Wicker Park, right? Uh, and it, it should it should show up as, and it does as actually the, the inverse of Wicker Park. Now this is back in two thousand. Seven or 2008. So we've got five guys now, and maybe we'll we'll become Wicker Park eventually. Uh, but it, they've, you know, the administration, uh, the university has 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 work cut out for it if it wants to make the cultural scene here feel like Wicker Park, and that has um, some implications for policy, obviously. Okay, so that's that's all I've got to say. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.